Good evening. How's everyone tonight? Good. Let's uh, go ahead and get started. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word, for the opportunities to be able to read it and study it and discuss it together. We pray for your spirit to lead us, to guide us, to direct us in this time. Use this time to strengthen our faith, to draw us closer to you and to one another. We ask this and all things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to say with me the words of the Jesus Creed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. I really struggled with a summary for tonight's chapter. and If I would have been thinking more clearly, I probably would have just had the face palm emoji, right? Because that really pretty much describes the story in this chapter. I went with a series of unfortunate events because it is a chapter full of sadness and brokenness. And what makes it unfortunate it never had to be that way. But you had people acting stupidly, selfishly, faithlessly, and it leads to all kinds of problems and struggles and turmoil. And yet, in the midst of it, in spite of that, we see one constant throughout, and that is God's faithful. No matter how bad his people get in rejecting him and ignoring him and going after other gods, no matter how great their sin is piled upon sin, is piled upon sin, it never gets so great that God abandons them or gives up on them. His faithfulness is constant and consistent. So we will look at this chapter Tonight, uh, we have quite a time period covered here. We begin in 930 BC with the kingdom divided. Uh, we see the reigns of King Jeroboam I, who has the northern tribes, the kingdom of Israel, and King Rehoboam in the southern tribe, uh, Judah. Uh, he's the bonehead that kind of really messed things up. Uh, then we see King Ahab and King Jehoshaphat, and this is, will take us through uh, the mid-800s B.C. Okay. And if you ever wonder where I get these from, it's that little <laughs> timeline on the bottom of each chapter, right? I think that's, that's really helpful. So if you, I want to kind of walk you through this chapter a little bit and point out a few things. Page 193, uh, note this, uh, this is part of the italics introduction of the chapter. Jeroboam fled to Egypt and waited there for an opportunity to make his next move. So, so notice the location of the flea. Right? Where, where are some other instances in scripture where we see this fleeing to Egypt? Okay, so Mary and Joseph with, yep, yep. What about before this? All right, uh, Joseph's brothers, when they are hungry and looking for food, they go to Egypt. So there's the, the, the children of Israel when they're wandering in the wilderness and they're sick and tired of manna. Where do they want to go back to? Egypt. All right, so there's this, this kind of consistent connection to Egypt that I think is just uh, very, very interesting. Um, next paragraph. But much of the population, especially from the other tribes, 
had grown to resent Solomon's heavy taxation and conscripted labor for his grand projects. And you read that and you kind of go, oh, yeah, that makes sense, right? Like we read last time about this, this grand construction and how big and massive everything is and, and all of the gold and the gold shields and all this impressive stuff going on. And you go, you don't necessarily stop to think about, yeah, who, who's, who's working this? Who's putting this together? What's, what's going on? Uh, and, and so after uh, working for, for Solomon for so long, uh, the folks in the northern tribes really began to resent him. And it, and it makes sense because if they're working in, in and around Jerusalem, none of the work that they're doing is really going to be anything they're going to be able to see or enjoy. Not on a regular basis, anyway. Uh, page 194. So the northern tribe leaders come to Rehoboam and they ask for a little bit of lighter workload. And Rehoboam says, go away for three days and then come back to me. And I was struck by the difference between Rehoboam and Solomon in terms of, of uh, wisdom. We're not told anywhere in here that Rehoboam asked for wisdom or discernment. And it's probably reasonable to conclude that for Solomon to have the decline that he had toward the end of his life, that things uh, were, were such that, that uh, God said that he was going to rip the kingdom uh, away from him. Uh, then we could probably safely assume that Rehoboam uh, never asked for wisdom. And in fact, we see the, the foolishness of him in these next paragraphs. Right? Did you notice that? Mm -hmm. so, so first he goes to the, to the elders, uh, and the elders tell him to do what with the request from the people? They told him to be a servant to the people. Yeah. Yep, right? Grant their request. Be nice to them now, and they'll be faithful to you forever. It's really pretty simple, right? Not, mm -hmm. not hard, okay? Um, but he didn't like that advice. And so he, he did what people can do often, is you keep asking until somebody gives you an answer that you want to hear. And so he... He asks, not the elderly, wise, experienced people who know way better. He asked the young, ignorant, <laughs> foolish people, right? These are, the, these are the realtors for House on the Sand <laughs> kind of guys, all right? And so their, their response is, well, if your father was harsh, you need to be more harsh, right? Get these, hello, you need to get things back in line, right? Get them doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, and so then Rehoboam's response is, uh, my father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. Okay. Yeah, not really, right? And then what kind of work is going on? Wow. Yeah. Okay, so, so do you hear echoes? in there from Pharaoh, mm -hmm. right? Moses goes to Pharaoh, says, let my people go. And uh, Pharaoh says, nope, and now you're going to make your bricks. You got to get your own straw for your bricks, right? So, so you, you see this kind of uh, harshness going on. Uh, page 194, bottom, bottom of the page. So the king did not listen to the people for this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahijah the Shilonite. Okay. So who's behind the scenes and the actions that we see here is the Lord. The Lord, Yahweh, God. One ninety five. Look at the I'm looking at the italicized paragraph about halfway down. Already divided in worship practices, the nation now also became divided 
in politics, in priesthood, in security, and in safety. Now, what would happen to Israel and Judah split by disputes their leaders could not resolve? And I wrote down next to this how incredibly sad, because this is nothing other than human pride and arrogance. It is a lust for power. And remember last week we were talking about um, the mission of God and how, how God set things up so that Israel would live life noticeably different from the nations around them so that through them and the way they lived their life in relationship with Yahweh, then the rest of the nations would know who Yahweh is, that that difference would be enough that it would speak powerfully to, to who Yahweh is so that the nations would know Yahweh because in knowing Yahweh, there is life and salvation. Okay? So this is, this is the key. Now when we see the state of God's people in, in such a way that they're indistinguishable from the nations around them, it, it's almost like an anti-mission kind of a thing, right? Well, it seems like he, all the tribes, they were more into the tribe than being one nation, you know? And, you know, they don't mention them too much in here, but the ones on the west side, they're doing their own thing too, really, aren't they? They haven't. You just hear about Israel, or Judah, and Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, and and uh, is you know that that's all the tribes. So even the ones that are on the the western shore, there's they're included with Israel, mm -hmm, right. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a mess. It is such a mess, and the. You know, the way that God set it up with, with like the lands, for example, with the property, uh, he, he arranged things in such a way that, that they would always have what they needed in those, those places. Even if, you, uh, even if you ended up in a situation where you sold a plot of land or you uh, entered into the, the service of, of uh, somebody else in, the, in their household as a servant, uh, the year of Jubilee always set things back. It was a great reset. So all debts were canceled. Any, any land that was sold was returned to the original owner. Uh, any servants uh, in, in uh, other households were returned back to their, to their home. It was, it was meant to be a, a great reset. The problem is, is that when people have power, they don't like to give it up. And the human tendency is, is to hold on to power and to try to obtain more power. And so you, you, we see these dynamics, um, we see these dynamics at, at, in play all over the place. Um, I'll hold that thought for later. Okay, look at, look at toward the bottom of 195. When Rehoboam arrived in Jerusalem, he mustered all Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 able young men, to go to war against Israel and to regain the kingdom for Rehoboam, son of Solomon. Okay. They're not fighting for Yahweh. They're fighting for... For Rehoboam, yeah, yeah. And so you can almost hear in this the echoes of faithless Israel trying to enter the promised land after they disobeyed God the first time. Right? Remember that part of the story? God told them to enter the promised land. They sent in spies. The spies came back. Uh, two of them said, this is a good deal. Let's go. The other ten were like, no way, Jose. This is a really bad idea. There's giants in there. We'll be like grasshoppers to them. And so the people didn't go, and Yahweh said, fine, you know, you're going to be wandering for, for until this generation dies off. And they said, oh, well, never mind. We'll go back. And they tried to, they tried to do it, and they got creamed, right, to use a technical theological term. They were just defeated bad. Okay. Um, 
and so here you have you have Rehoboam who had an opportunity to to act kindly to keep the kingdom united he failed to do that and now he's trying to kind of reunite it on his own terms 196 uh, Jeroboam. So, so Rehoboam is Solomon's son. Jeroboam is the one that God chose to be the leader, the, the king of the, the ten tribes of the nation of Israel. Okay. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David if these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. They will again give their allegiance to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. All right, so what's his, what's his concern? If you, if you think about this from a, a political science kind of a perspective, right? You've got, you've got King Rehoboam in the south. The capital is Jerusalem. You've got King Jeroboam in the north with the, the ten tribes. Uh, why does he why does he care about Jerusalem? What's going on there? What's in Jerusalem? The temple. The temple. And, yeah. and he was the right you know, he's the one with the right hand person. Yeah. Sit in the capital. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so it makes sense, right? You you make a you make a pilgrimage every year or twice a year or three times a year that was actually three times a year to the temple to offer sacrifices and and do the things that that the Lord commanded to be done, and it makes sense that you would begin to feel a search, certain uh, affection and affinity toward that place. And Jeroboam's concern here is really quite reasonable. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. What's the problem? The problem is that he takes matters into his own hands. Okay? Yeah. So isn't it interesting what he does here? Like this is this is just incredible. So so what's his solution? Well, I'm gonna put my little churches all around me, high places. Yeah. Okay. And appoint my own priests. Okay, yeah, so 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 he kind of re builds the the whole thing but but what uh, what does he do before that look at the the very next line yeah what kind of idols two golden calves yeah right where do we see two golden calves yeah mount sinai right aaron didn't build one but he built two um, if you, if, if you were here for the Sunday morning Bible study, as we're going through Isaiah, we got to a point in Isaiah where Isaiah talked about, uh, the, the brass serpent that Moses made in the wilderness, uh, that that was kept and, and it was, uh, it was something that people bowed down to and worshiped and, and, and all that stuff. So that, that would have, that's kind of in play in in all of this I, I thought that that was that was kind of interesting uh, but here Jeroboam builds two golden calves okay why so, so so let's try to think about this I don't think it's random so so why Well, right. Yes. So, but but why not build separate? Why not just build temples? Why build two golden calves to to go with it? Well, the convenience in the sense that they don't have to travel nearly as far. Yep, absolutely. But why the calves? Right. Yeah, that's the right answer. Uh, who knows? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I think it's an interesting connection to what happened on Sinai. Uh, on one level, on a, uh, on a spiritual level, it, it's showing us that kind of uh, rebellion, that lack of faithfulness. It's kind of letting us know that 
that the good that we had seen in David is is kind of undone uh, here as as this happens. Uh, that people have a tendency to be drawn toward uh, something that they can grasp with their senses. Right? Uh, and it's, remember what we, we were talking about this earlier, it, it's what the nations around them did. It's the kind of things that they did. So, so this, this taps deep into the roots of, of their history and where they came from and experience and and all that kind of stuff. I, I think it's just absolutely fascinating. But they did this completely knowing that it had been done before and this abomination, right? It's just skin. It's like, what, did, what else did they do? Oh, <laughs> he only did half of the <laughs> Yeah. He used an inferior search engine, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, and I I'd started to think that too, except that, at this point, he doesn't care. Because if he did, he wouldn't be doing this in the first place. His, his, his thought is not, how do I help God's people nurture their relationship with God? His thought process is, how do I keep my people in my kingdom? Who had the people been previously worshipped? Because it says right there at the bottom, the people came to worship. Who were they worshipping previous? Yes, Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they were supposed to be worshiping Yahweh, but there was also this constant battle with with Baal worship yeah. and Asherah worship, and we've we've talked about that before, right? Okay. Um, and, and so that's just a, a constant and consistent thing, and and part of this uh, is is connected back to ultimately the failure of the people to to remove from the land. Uh, the ones that they were supposed to in the first place. So, so we're, you've got all of the kind of the implications of of that. So now they're, excuse me, they're reaping the harvest of of that uh, failure. And I say that I, I don't say that lightly because we're we're talking about human beings ultimately. So, so the way that that uh, Jeroboam. Rehobo- Jeroboam, excuse me, the way that Jeroboam set it up, and, and this is really brilliant, is, is he built two altars, one in the north and one in the south. Bethel is, is the location of the one. Does that, does that name ring a bell? It means house of God, Bethel. So Bethlehem is house of bread. Uh, Bethel is house of God. All right, we've, we've seen this. There's a very well-known story that takes place in Bethel. It was named by Jacob after he was fleeing from his brother Esau because he ripped the guy off for a bowl of stew or lentil soup. And he went to sleep one night and he had a dream. And, nope, not yet. not yet. No, he had a dream, and he saw a ladder going up to heaven, and he saw uh, angels ascending and descending, and he said, surely this is the house of God. Okay. So the spot where Jacob had his, his, his dream. And then the other one is, is in the north in, um, in, in the city of Dan. This is one of the, the. This is probably the northernmost point, or very close to the northernmost point of of the territory. It's by the um, it's by the mouth of the Jordan River. It's a it's a pretty significant uh, place and site. When uh, when we were there in 2017, uh, they had a a frame. It was a metal frame. That was to show us what the dimensions of the altar would have been like. Okay. Now, when I, before this experience, when I thought altar, I was thinking probably something like this size, or something that's upstairs in the in the sanctuary. Uh, but actually, the 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 altar that would have been in these spots was probably uh, about this size. So if you go from here to that wall to there to there and back here that's that's the size that you're talking about and you go wow that's that's pretty big but then if you think about they're sacrificing cows and all kinds of giant animals on the thing it, it makes sense right? 
and it was it was tall too. It was it was um, it was more than six feet tall, and just a huge huge thing. Um, so Jeroboam is trying to keep his people in his uh, in his nation. And to keep their allegiances for himself. Okay. And while it's a it's a smart political move, it's sinful. Okay. Um, and, and so then uh, God sends a a prophet and says, "This is this is not okay." Uh, the altar will be split apart, and ashes of it will be poured on the ground, and then that happens. Okay. And there was that whole instance where Jeroboam, uh, his hand seized up, and uh, he, asked, he asked the prophet to pray for him. The prophet did. He was healed. Okay. And then 197. Even after this, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways, but once again appointed priests for the high places and all sorts of people. Anyone who wanted to become a priest, he consecrated for the high places. So he was the first internet ordination service where anybody that wanted that could just log in, uh, you pay the fee, and you're good to go. Uh, why is this an issue? Why does it matter who, who's a priest and not a priest? That's right, but why does that matter? Okay, so maybe maybe a, a matter of seminaries. Oh, so so that's a very good practical reason. Think a little bit more simplistically than that. Who set it up this way? God. So the issue is more than anything else, and I'm sure the other things played into it, okay, uh, but more than anything else, the issue at stake here is that this is a rejection of what God told them to do. Remember Eden. People had a choice to do things God's way or to do things their own way, and they took matters into their own hands, and that's exactly what ha what's happening here, okay? Jeroboam is is taking matters into his own hands and he's kind of redoing everything and at the heart of it is not Yahweh at the heart of it is Jeroboam mm -hmm. yeah. really because he never lied to his brothers and guys you know if he's appointing the other guys priests then the Levites yeah. were yeah, because remember the Levites had no land. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, their inheritance was to be the the temple. They received a portion of the the sacrifices. That's how they were able to support themselves and their families. Yep. Okay. Bottom of page one ninety seven. Uh, here here's the message given to Jeroboam. I raised you up from among the people and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. Oh. Um, I, it doesn't say, I wonder, as as Jeroboam is making all these changes, okay, I, I wonder if part of his thinking is that God made me king. He gave me this position for the, the good and the well-being of these people, so I'm going to do what's in their best interest, okay? So, so I think we can be a little sympathetic I think his, if that's his line of thought, that makes sense. What's the problem with it? He's wrong. <laughs> his line of thought. Not Just because something makes sense doesn't mean it's right. right. Um, yeah. So, uh, I tore the kingdom away from the house of David, gave it to you, but you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commands and followed me with all his heart, doing only what was right in my eyes. You have done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made for yourself other gods, idols made of metal. You have aroused my anger and turned your back on me. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, and then we see this this really sad situation where, um, or this is part of that really sad situation where uh, the son of Jeroboam, Abijah, gets sick. And, and so uh, Jeroboam sent his wife in disguise to the prophet Ahijah, not to be confused with Abijah, uh, to Ahijah who didn't see well. Uh, so she went disguised to try to to try to figure out um, what's going to happen to the child, and uh, because the prophet speaks the words of Yahweh, he's not fooled, uh, and so then speaks this way. Uh, and, and these are just heart, heartbreaking words. Um, As for you, go back home. When you set foot in your city, the boy will die. All Israel will mourn for him and bury him. That's that's tragic in and of itself. He is the only one belonging to Jeroboam who will be buried because he is the only one in the house of Jeroboam in whom the Lord, the God of Israel, has found anything good. Ouch. It is just gut-wrenching. Page 199. People engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. So this is, again, that kind of that undoing of the mission, right? If God's people are not living their lives according to the covenant, then how are the nations going to know who Yahweh is? If there's no distinguishable difference between them and the nations around them, if if they're worshiping other gods alongside of Yahweh, then what difference is Yahweh over anything else? Right. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shizak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem. He carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. Remember how much stuff was there. Now, I had forgotten about this. I I thought that it was lost with uh, the Babylonian attack. Uh, But it actually happened much, much sooner. There was continual warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and Rehoboam rested with his ancestors and was buried with them in the city of David. His mother's name was Naamah. She was an Ammonite, not an Israelite. And Abijah, his son, succeeded him as king. So Jeroboam and Rehoboam, not only did they have names that rhymed, uh, but they both had sons named Abijah. Uh, So it it can get a little bit confusing. Okay. So Abijah rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David, and Asa, his son, succeeded him as king. Top of page 200. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David had done. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. He even deposed his grandmother Maka from her position as queen mother because she made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. Asa cut it down, burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. He brought into the temple of the Lord the silver and gold and the articles that he and his father had dedicated. You finally start to go, okay, feels like things are getting bad. No. Because what was the caveat here? What, what didn't he do? Where did he fall short? 
What did he miss? He did not remove the high places. So the high places were, were uh, places that were set up uh, on tops of, of hills and mountains to worship other gods. Because the idea is, right, humans are on earth, the gods are in the heavens, and if you're going to talk to the gods and you want to increase the chances of them hearing you, um, you, you can yell, okay? your voice might get hoarse after a while. The next best option is to get as close to the heavens as you can get, and so they would often go up high places. Uh, and if there weren't any natural high places, then people would build towers, uh, i.e. Babel, or pyramids. Right? So Asa did a mostly good job, but not what needed to be done. And again, it's, it, it's this, this same pattern. God's people, they, you had one job. It said you had one job, and they dropped the ball. And again, and again. Um, then we get to Ahab. Uh, and there's all kinds of mess with that. We'll, we'll get into the, the more familiar story behind him, and actually his wife and the prophet Elijah in chapter 15. But notice at the bottom... Of page 202, the last paragraph. In Ahab's time, Hael of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abriam, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. And so you have here then um, an indication of just the total and complete disregard for Yahweh and his word. And Eden and, and Babel are still very much in effect here. People are doing what is right in their own eyes. They're doing what they want to do. And the costs and consequences do not matter. It's Eden. It's taken matters into their own hands. It's Bethel. Uh, it's, it's trying to overthrow God and make a name for themselves, right? It's that kind of thing uh, going on. There is nothing new under the sun. Enter faceplant emoji. So before we get to the discussion questions, um, do you have any questions, thoughts, comments, reactions uh, as, as we look at this? Why did he remove his uh, things that were in high places where the place was there? So it doesn't tell us why, right? Um, but I would, I would have to imagine that... Uh, <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of political pressure being put on him. Because, look. Well, the people have been practicing this yep. for a while now, and you're taking away from them. There's going to be an uproar. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Or or the people that, so so the people that are doing the worshiping, they're, they're not going to be happy about it. The people for whom that is their career, their job, they're not going to be happy about it. Uh, and, and so there's, there's, from a human perspective only, the sense of give and take, right? So he did a lot of good things, but he didn't do everything that needed to be done. Uh, and, and so this was the result. Why? We can only speculate. But I think my speculation is pretty good. I'm 97.3% confident uh, in my speculation. Maybe 0.4. I don't want to. I don't want to push it too much.
Well, it's just, you know, it'd be steep in the high places to keep the people happy. It's like little fiction. They took stuff away and people were still, you know, they'd find any way to get alcohol. So that didn't stop that part, you know. It's just it's not interesting enough, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, pe people people do what they want to do, right? And and again, that's that that's that whole struggle here. That's ultimately that that struggle. Everything goes back to Eden, and and each time we read these these stories in the scriptures, we see people have an opportunity to do things God's way or to do things their own way. And you're going to see this pattern. It's going to keep repeating itself over and over and over and over until finally we get to Jesus who breaks that pattern. He doesn't choose to do things his own way. He doesn't choose uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He ultimately chooses the tree of the cross so that he can once and for all defeat the power of that serpent uh, who, who keeps... Uh, coming up again and again and again and again as you as you see these these patterns and you hear these echoes from from one story to the other it's it's really profound to see how everything kind of connects how it plays off of each other how it builds off of each other uh, and, and this this kind of vicious cycle just repeats again and again and again until we get to Jesus who then breaks it now God's people don't have a stellar track record after Jesus. We still wrestle with sin. We still struggle with this. Uh, we still fall short. Uh, but the difference between now and then is that now we have the power of the Holy Spirit in a way that not everybody did back then. Some did, right? The prophets uh, had a special measure of, of God's Spirit, but uh, not everybody had it. Uh, but we have that today and that is not insignificant by any stretch of the imagination so then you get into you think about that and then uh, some of the language of the new testament about being dead to sin uh, and and having a new life and living a new life uh, kind of carries with it i think some more uh, meaning and significance and power as we think through this and, and what that means and the implications of it for us. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So if you want to jump to page 479, look at some of these these questions. Some of these we've, we've kind of touched on a little bit. Um, So what caused the kingdom of Israel to be divided? Pride? Stubbornness? Probably wouldn't have happened if the women were in charge. Absolutely. All right. uh, a lack of faith in God? Right, that faithlessness, and when I when I say faithlessness, I'm not talking about uh, unbelief. I'm talking about not trusting God. Uh, when you hear the word faith, you really want to think more in terms of trust than in uh, intellectual assent. So belief, uh, I, I think in our culture we tend to talk about belief like, I believe that something exists, right? Uh, I, I believe in Santa Claus, kind of a language, uh, as opposed to uh, belief being trust. I trust what God says. Okay? So to say I believe in God does not mean I believe that he exists, uh, but more importantly, I trust God. Okay? That existence is still there as part of it, because you can't trust something that you don't think exists. Uh, but, but to... To, to just believe that God exists, right, for, for belief to only be equated with knowledge uh, of existence, 
doesn't lead to action. Trust leads to action. Okay. If I trust that God is going to do what God has said God is going to do, then that is going to have implications on my actions. And this makes sense. So think about Abraham, right? Uh, God says to Abraham at the age of 75 years young that he's going to have a child. Okay. Um, and Abraham waits and he waits and he waits and he gets to 90 and he says, so Lord, what's going on with this, with this child? Uh, and God says, don't worry about it. Your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sands on the seashore. And Abraham says, gotcha. And he takes matters into his own hands. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, again, it's, it's humanity doing things, yeah. right? Okay. And, and ultimately at the heart of that is a lack of trust. They're not believing that God is going to do what God said God was going to do. And because they did not believe that and they took matters into their own hands, then it created a series of consequences and problems and turmoils and things like that for them. Right? Um, now, eventually he gets it and he does what he's supposed to do. And we, we kind of we get to that with the, the story of Isaac. And God says, I want you to to sacrifice your son and Abraham's good from that point from that point on um, but when we really believe when we really trust God then we live according to that okay. this is why James will say you say you believe in God good for you even the demons believe that and shudder okay. All right. um, and, and so that's kind of the the idea behind faith without works is is dead. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good analogy. All right, how did number two, how did Rehoboam and Jeroboam both make mistakes? I don't think we have enough time to answer. Took matters in their own hands. They were arrogant. They were prideful. What observations do you make about God's character and what is important to God based on this chapter? Okay, trusting in him. Yeah. Yeah, obedience. Why? We know that those things are important, but why does it matter to God? That we trust in our obedience. So, so okay, so God's perfect, right? And God is complete and whole. God doesn't need anything from us. God is not lacking in anything that we could that we could provide. He's not dependent on us. So whether humanity exists or doesn't exist. God is still whole and complete and perfect. God does not need humanity. Okay? So, so in the ancient world, it was believed that uh, the gods fed on the worship and prayers and sacrifices of the people, which is why if you were going to go uh, on a journey on the sea, you would want to make sure that Poseidon was well fed and in a good mood. So you would offer a, a sacrifice because a grumpy god of the sea is not fun. Uh, to contend with when you're on a boat, and and so that was that was kind of the idea, uh, but God is not that way. So why is it important to God that people obey Him and trust Him? Because He created us out of love. He He loves us, and His He requires obedience for 
our benefit, yeah. our protection, yeah. our provision. Yep, very good. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not because God needs it. It's because right. we need it. And and when we trust in God and we we live life God's way, then then we not only experience life the way that it was meant to be experienced, but we're spared the trouble and the turmoil and the consequences that come with with ignoring that. Right. Well, I, I, yeah. So so I find it really helpful to think of the Ten Commandments uh, in terms of a fence that's designed to protect relationships okay and so the analogy that i like to use and i apologize that I, I don't have new analogies but i really like this one okay so so imagine you're going to a zoo right and and you're walking along through the zoo and you you see uh this tree this beautiful big tree that has a tire swing on it and you love tire swings but there's this fence uh, between you and the tire swing and you, you think for a moment, uh, it's been a long time since you've been on a tire swing. This is America. It's a free country. You, know, you, you can be able to go wherever you want to go. And so you hop the fence. You get on this tire swing. And you are just having a grand old time. And you're going back and forth and high. And you can feel the, the wind in your hair. And it is glorious and spectacular. And then all of a sudden, on your back swing, you stop with a sudden thud. And you he feel the warm air on the back of your neck from the breath of the 400-pound silverback gorilla that never learned the virtues of sharing. <laughs> And suddenly that fence has a whole different meaning to you, right? Before, you were seeing it as something that was preventing you and inhibiting you from doing what you wanted to do and what you in your mind had to be the freedom to, to be able to do. I should have the freedom to do what I want to do. Uh, the reality of the fence was not that it was there to prevent or limit your freedom, but it was there to prevent you from that 400-pound silverback gorilla who was going to introduce nothing but pain and suffering into your life. And when we, when we disregard what, what God tells us in terms of how we live our life, there are consequences that come with that. It's not that God is punishing us necessarily. I wouldn't think of it that way. But when we, when we lose trust in a relationship or we break trust in a relationship, there are consequences to that. And it's really hard to get that trust back. Mm -hmm. But when we, when we follow the commandments, when we, when we keep that, as well as we are able to as imperfect, sinful human beings, uh, it goes a long way in, in protecting those relationships. And in those points where, where we do fail to, to heed those boundaries, that's where for us as New Testament people, uh, forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation comes into play. Uh, so that when we, when we do sin against one another, we're able to go to, to each other and, and seek uh, forgiveness and be reconciled to one another and have that relationship restored right um, but even then it may take a little bit of time for trust to be built back up right but this is why it matters to God because it it's has an impact on us does that make sense right and I think that's a in my mind that's that's so much a better way to think of it than just well you don't want to make God mad because he's got one heck of a temper and if you make them mad, it's it's really going to be bad for you. That's I don't think that's a helpful way to uh, to approach it, right? So so that's why it's in, that answer is number four. Right? That's why it's important to always remain loyal to God, uh, not because he's petty and he likes to punish people that don't do what he wants, uh, but because ultimately it's it's for our own good. Um, question five is really for you to answer at home. Okay. Um, in what ways has God been kind to you even when you didn't deserve it? I, I, I can speak for me uh, with this one. And 
God gives us his grace and mercy because of who God is. Uh, and because he loves us and delights in us, apart from anything we do to earn his love. Right? We can't earn his love. We, we can act as if we did or do sometimes. But the reality is, is that we can't. Uh, God isn't the disappointed father who's always going, what did I do to deserve this? Right? What's wrong with you people? Okay, I, <laughs> look at all this stuff I've done for you, and this is, this is how you treat me? Uh, that's, that's not how... Yeah, he's, he sees us in the way that the father uh, from the parable of the prodigal son sees his son, both his sons, because both of his sons are not good guys. They each have their issues. Uh, and yet the father for, for both of them is patient and he is loving beyond human comprehension. And that's how our God sees us and loves us and delights in us. You, you matter to him. He values you and delights in you. And that's a really cool thing. Uh, and we have that Again, not because we deserve it, but because God simply loves us and really declares us to be worthy of it. So. All right. Next week, we will be on summer break. Uh, you are welcome to come. I won't be here. Uh, we will resume on September 14th, and we'll, we'll pick up with chapter 15. Okay. So that's where, uh, that's, that's what will happen uh, with, with this class. On July 13th, if you haven't heard yet, uh, we're going to do Sundays on Wednesday, which is just so much fun to say. Um, Sundays on Wednesday uh, will be an ice cream social, time to just hang out and have fun. Maybe play some games, uh, all that kind of good stuff. And then, at, so that starts at 6. And then at 7, uh, John Perovich, who is our new music director, will be putting on a concert uh, for us. Um, I've, I talked to John about this the other day. He said that his wife already told him that he's not allowed to have a three-hour concert. <laughs> So I'm, I'm very excited for, for this. John is an exceptional musician. Uh, we, we heard a little bit of that at his, um, when he was playing uh, uh, last month at the service. But he's, he writes his own music and is, is very prolific in that. Uh, and, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, bring friends and family and neighbors. Uh, and we'll have a good time on July 13th when we do Sundays on Wednesday and have music and all kinds of good stuff. All right? Let's, uh, let's close by praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you much. We'll see you next time. Have a good night.